Now, the, the main purpose of this talk is not only to, you know, oh no, maybe I should start off with a joke. <laughs> it usually works. <laughs> now, um, over the past, you know, 25 years, this year will be 25 years that I've spoken to a lot of Christians concerning this topic of, you know, creation, evolution, and so forth. So I don't know if you've, you've heard this joke. This little girl came to her mother one day, and she asked her mother, Mom, I don't understand. You know, what is, what is the true origin of humans? Where do humans really come from? Now, mother said, my child, it's very easy to explain. If you read in the book of Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God created Adam and Eve, and that's where everybody comes from. Then, of course, the little girl went straight to her dad, and she asked her dad the same question. Where do humans come from? Her father said, my child, it's very easy to explain. If you look at what the world's leading scientists have discovered up to now, it's pretty clear we come from the apes and the monkeys, and over millions of years of evolution, we've actually changed now into human beings. Now, when the little girl heard that, she immediately ran back to her mother there in the kitchen, and she said, Mom, I don't understand. Why is it that when I ask you concerning the topic of origins, you say we come from Adam and Eve, but Dad says we come from the apes and the monkeys? And again, Mother looked at her, she smiled, and she, and she said, My child, very easy to explain. You have to remember, I was referring to my side of the family, and... <laughs> 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 so that's just <laughs> to start the evening off on a lighter note. But hopefully you can also see the seriousness in that joke. And it is that people today have questions concerning the topic of origins. They've got questions concerning what the word teaches us, how everything came into existence, what science has to say concerning the origin of the universe. They've got, you know, want to know how does science fit into the Bible. So hopefully by the end of tonight, Talk, you will have a better understanding concerning the topic of origins. And hopefully you will also see that there's a definite, clear connection between the book of Genesis and the gospel message. And that the gospel message actually already starts in the book of Genesis. Now, as I said, I've been speaking over the past 25 years, spoke to a lot of specifically Christians concerning this topic of biblical creation versus evolution. And usually most of them, the majority of them will tell me that, you know, Peter, this is really not such an important topic for us as Christians. It's like a, like a side issue in our faith, how everything came into existence. What's important in the Christian faith is Jesus Christ. Just focus on Jesus, trust in Jesus. That's the important part. Now, we don't have a problem with that. You know, we want people to turn to Jesus, put their faith and trust in him. But we want people to trust in Jesus because God's word is speaking the truth. Literally, from the very first verse in the Bible. So I'm quickly going to show, to you, show you what's currently happening in America, among the Christian youth in America. Now, this is a study that was done the first time more than 20 years ago by a group called George Barna Research. Since then, they've repeated the study several times, and every time they basically get the same result. They discovered that up to 70% of Christian children brought up in a Christian home and in the church will walk away from their faith after they leave home. That is 70% of children who's been putting their faith and trust in Jesus their entire lives. Then they leave their parents' homes, go into the world, and then they turn their back on Christ. They stop reading the Bible, and they don't go to church anymore. So these guys said, wow, what's happening in America? Let's do a bit of further research to see if we can maybe figure out what's going on. And can you guess what they discovered is currently the number one reason for this phenomenon there in America? It's because the children in those American schools are being taught evolution. So the kids are sitting there thinking to themselves, wow, it sounds like as if science has disproven the Bible, not where chapter one. And then they think to themselves, okay, if we can't trust the first chapter in the Bible, where can we start to trust the Bible? Can you really trust the Bible further on concerning the things it talks about? And it's literally currently an epidemic in America how those kids are turning specifically into atheists. You see, in America, evolution has been taught more than 60 years already to those children in those American schools. So that's basically three generations which has passed through that education system. Here in South Africa, we are currently busy with our first generation. This year is exactly 17 years since evolution has been introduced into the grade 12 life science curriculum. So if 
We want to prevent that our kids go down the same road as those American children. It's time for us to act and do something about it and get equipped with answers. Then I just also quickly want to uh, stand still at the word evolution because it's a word that can have different meanings, very slippery word. Basically, at its core, it means change or change over time. Now, our organization believes in change happening because we can observe change happening in nature. But the kind of change happening out there in the world is not evolution that's going on. Now, what do I mean by that? The world tells us there's two kinds of change, two kinds of evolution. The first one is known as microevolution or change within a kind. And we don't have a problem with that. That's, for instance, where you start to breed with a parent population of butterflies. Over the years, you produce lots of offspring, and eventually you end here with two daughter populations, which definitely underwent change. Now, there's change in coloration, maybe change in body size, whatever. But the key here is we started off with a butterfly, and we ended with butterflies. So it's still the same kind of a creature, not species. That's a man-made term. And this is the kind of change we actually expect to see out there in nature because that's what the Bible teaches us. In Genesis 1, it teaches us 10 times that God created the creatures according to their kinds, to breed according to their kinds. So we expect that dogs will give you dogs, cats will give you cats, kangaroos will give you kangaroos, and elephants will give you elephants. So no problem there. But now the world comes specifically to our children, and it teaches our children that if you give this kind of change just enough time, just give it millions of years, you can change that sheep into a cow or that butterfly into a bee or something like that. And this is so-called macroevolution that the children are being taught, where people believe over these alleged millions of years, all life went back to a simple-celled organism, and then it changed from one kind into another kind, from simple to more and more complex creatures. And that kind of change has never, ever been observed to happen in nature, where one kind is busy changing into another kind. That's why we are against this sort of change. But unfortunately, that is all our children are being taught today at school. Then they go to university, same thing. Then they get back home in the afternoons, and they're exposed to what the world has to say. Organizations like National Geographic, their programs are very pro-evolution. I mean, radio stations, you get radio sonder geloof. Ach, grense. Very pro-evolution. Newspapers, movies. I mean, it's just the one side of the story we're ever exposed to. And our children are sitting at home thinking, we're nothing special. We're just accidents of nature. Highly evolved animals, highly evolved apes. But do you know what is the take-home message that gets stuck with the kids? The Bible isn't true. The Bible has been disproven. You, it's full of lies. You can't trust the Bible. You see, people don't realize that there is actually an alternative to the theory of evolution, and it is called biblical creation. But unfortunately, not a lot of people are currently being exposed to this kind of information, the stuff that you are going to hear tonight. So that's where our organization fits into the picture. Creation Ministries International is a faith-funded nonprofit organization. We currently have seven offices around the world. And primarily, we're an information ministry. So we produce information to help people to defend the authority and the accuracy of Scripture from the very first verse. And we get that information into various resources we produce. Books, there's videos on our website, magazine, and so forth. And the idea with our resources is that people will get a hold of it for themselves and equip themselves with answers. Now, specifically parents. Because just think of it, if parents are equipped concerning this topic, they can in turn go and equip their children, later on their grandchildren, and show them what's written in the Bible is the truth, and we can trust it. And that's actually what the Bible commands us to do in 1 Peter 3 verse 15. It says, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Now, one of the main resources that we have is, of course, our website. Very easy web address. It is just called creation.com. And on that website, you will find about 15,000 different articles to go and read. 45 years of creation information that you can access there. So all you need to do is you just go to that search engine, top right corner, and you type in there the question you've always wanted an answer to. For instance, where did Cain get a wife? Where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? Where do all the different races come from if everybody goes back to Adam and Eve? 
How do these radiometric dating methods work? Anything you can think of, just type it in there. And as I said, currently about 15,000 articles that you can go and read for free on this website concerning those kinds of questions. It's all for free, so you can read it, you can download it onto your computer, you can even forward it to your friends and family. And in such a way, use our website as a resource to reach the world out there more effectively with the gospel message. Another method we have is via our electronic newsletter. Now we call our newsletter an InfoByte. And the idea with the InfoByte is really to keep people up to date with the latest claims made by the evolutionists every day in the secular media. If they dig up another ape man one of these days somewhere here in Africa, within a couple of days, our guys will come together and then they will write an easy to understand article from a scientific biblical perspective so that you can make sense of that kind of information. And I can maybe just mention, we currently have nine PhD scientists who's working for us full time doing our research and writing these kinds of articles. So if you are sitting here tonight thinking, man, maybe I should get a free email like that from time to time, I've got some great news for you because we are going to let you subscribe tonight. We're going to circulate forms, they look like this, and if you want the email, just fill in your name and surname, postal code and email address, and then we will put you on our list. Now I promise you we are not going to flood your inbox with emails, it's like maximum two a month we send out, and at the end of each email there is an opportunity, if you don't want to receive it anymore, you can just unsubscribe. So they're going to circulate it like you know, collection plates, just send it along the row, they will collect it again. So while you are busy with that, I will carry on with the message just to save a bit of time tonight. So when it gets down to the topic of biblical creation versus evolution, Let's first have a look at what the Bible has to say. You know, the Bible teaches us that God created everything in six literal 24-hour days from nothing by just speaking. I mean, that's the big picture we get there in Genesis 1. I think that's what we all believed when we were little children. But if this is true, then it means that the dinosaurs were created on day six together with Adam and Eve. And that dinosaurs lived in the Garden of Eden. So that's what the Bible has to say concerning this topic. If we have a look at what man has to say, science, it's totally a different picture. Then it's these millions of years of evolution that occurred where they believe one kind changed into another kind. So right from the start, you can see there's a clear, definite contradiction between what the world has to say and what the Bible has to say concerning the topic of origins. Now, seeing that I believe you all know what it says in Genesis, I'm first of all tonight going to start off with what science has to say concerning this topic. Then we're going to come back to what the Bible has to say. We are going to compare the two with each other. Then after each talk tonight, there will be an opportunity. If you may have a few questions, I will try my best to see if I can give you a proper answer. So let's start off with science. What exactly is science? Now, if you go and look in a dictionary, it is very simple definition that you find. Science is knowledge that you acquire through observations and experiments. Is that simple? In other words, ladies and gentlemen, proper scientific research can only be done in the present. You can only make observations in the present. You can only set up experiments in the present. You can only repeat your experiments in the present. We cannot go back into the past to go and observe what happened there, even yesterday. We can't go back to yesterday to go and set up an experiment, for instance. Do you agree? Right, so this kind of science, we refer to it as experimental science. And as you heard, that's what I studied for six years of my life at the University of the Free State. I studied zoology, did a master's degree in zoology, then I became a high school life science teacher, and I taught kids how to do this kind of science. How to make your observation, how to set up your experiment, how to set up your controls. So our organization, we're not against science. We love science, this kind of science that can be done in the present. Because there's another kind of science that's also doing the rounds out there. That's actually our kids are being exposed to this kind of science. And it is what we refer to as historical science. It's kind of like a forensic science because it's when you look at evidence in the present, for instance, fossils, and then you try to figure out what happened there in the past to lead to what I have here with me in the present. Now, a quick question concerning fossils, and please shout out the answer if you have the answer. Who can tell me, where do fossils exist? In the past or in the present? Past, present? Oh, now I see frowning. Okay, <laughs> let me repeat the question and see if the reaction is maybe a bit differently. Now, I brought a real fossil along with me tonight. 
Can everybody see it? Right, this specific fossil, where does it exist? Where do we find it? In the past or here in the present? present. Now everybody's saying present. Can you see how you've already been evolutionized by the world to think that something like fossils exist in the past? The creature lived in the past. It died in the past. It got fossilized in the past. But we sit with the evidence today in the present. All fossils on earth exist in the present. All evidence on earth exists in the present. We don't have the past. Only history can tell us what happened in the past. But the moment people come up with all sorts of stories concerning what they think happened there in the past, they actually, they're invoking their belief system about the past, what they believed happened there in the past. And we sit with basically today with the same situation in court cases. In any court case, there's always two sides to a story. You know, that guy is either guilty or innocent. And those two legal teams come to the courtroom with basically the same evidence they collected there on the crime scene, but they come with different stories, different interpretations concerning what they believe happened there in the past. And at the end of the day, the judge has to decide whose story, whose interpretation best fits with the evidence. And that's literally what you are going to do tonight. You know, tonight you are the judge. You know, your whole life you've heard what the evolutionists had to say concerning the topic of origins. Tonight we are going to share a bit of information with you. And then you have to decide for yourself whose interpretation makes the most sense. All right, so... Up to now, tonight, hopefully, you've already learned a couple of new things. So let's use that now to look at an example that the world shows us quite frequently to try and convince us that this earth is millions and billions of years old. And that is, of course, something like the Grand Canyon in America. Now, when we look at something like the Grand Canyon, what's usually the first thing that comes to mind? What do people usually think of? Oh, millions of years. Just look how old that canyon is. Not so? Now, why is that happening? Because that's how the world has been training us to think. Now, the world teaches us that each one of those rock layers, those fine sedimentary rock layers, were slowly, gradually laid down over a period of a year or something along those lines. So when you look at these millions of fine sedimentary rock layers, one on top of another, people believe that they are looking at millions of years of Earth's history. And that's literally where the idea of millions of years first started. It was towards the end of the 1700s that scientists for the first time, ge geologists for the first time ever started speaking in terms of millions of years. Long before things like radiometric dating methods were invented, carbon-14 dating methods were invented, and there are problems with those dating methods. I mean, they are full of all sorts of assumptions. We have material on that. But here's quickly to show you where the idea of millions of years first started. It comes from this belief system that rock layers were laid down slowly over millions of years. But now the interesting thing is the following, and it is that the great founding fathers of modern science, and I'm talking here of famous people like Sir Isaac Newton, Louis Pasteur, those guys, back in their days, they also saw canyons, they also saw rock layers, but a guy like Newton never once looked at rock layers and saw millions of years in them. When he looked at rock layers, he always told himself, yep, that's only a few thousand years old. Because Newton believed that canyon and those rock layers were laid down with Noah's flood about four and a half thousand years ago. But today we look at exactly the same canyons and pictures that Newton saw. And what's usually the first thing that comes to mind? Millions of years. Now, why is that happening? Why is it that when we look at pictures like this, we see millions of years in them, but Newton only saw thousands of years in them? Just think of it. What has changed over the past 200 years here on Earth? Because the evidence didn't change. It is exactly the same rock layers. But you know what has changed? Our way of thinking, our mindset. We are absolutely being indoctrinated by the secular media and the education institutions to believe that rock layers are proof positive to millions of years. And that's currently happening to your children and your grandchildren at school and at university. Now, when people start talking about rock layers, they will first of all refer to the millions of years, but then they will also refer to fossils. 
the remain of dead things that we find there in those rock layers. So let's first of all have a look at what the world teaches us, how do fossils form. Now this is a typical textbook illustration of fossilization, where they tell us when a creature dies in water, like this crocodile, it'll sink down to the bottom of the river or the lake or the dam, and then gradually it'll get covered with these sedimentary rock layers. And then the textbook says, over millions of years, look at that word, they teach us those rock layers will harden, and then eventually through wind and water erosion, those upper rock layers will wash away or blow away, that will expose the fossil, and that is how we find the fossils today. Right, let's have another look at this explanation, but from a more critical perspective, because what you see happening here, is that what we observe happening out there in nature? Because what happens to dead things that die in water? Where do they go? Dead fish in a dam. Do they sink to the bottom of the dam? Where do they go? They float. They bloat and float. And when creatures float at the surface of water, they're exposed to scavengers that will start to eat them. And they will start to decompose and rot away and break apart. And there will be basically nothing left to get fossilized. Even the bones that sink down to the bottom, there at the bottom are invertebrates like crabs, bacteria. You get worms that only eat bones, that will literally break those bones down to dust. So that is not how you form a fossil at all. If you want to change a creature into a fossil, for instance, this goldfish, what you need to do with Goldie is you need to go and bury her rapidly. So instantaneously, we go and dump a lot of ground and mud and sediment on top of Goldie. There she is now completely covered, not exposed to scavengers that can feed on her. She's lying there intact as a unit, as a whole, exposed to a minimum amount of oxygen and bacteria so the decomposition process will be much slower. And if we have the right conditions in those sediments, the right pressure, temperature, moisture, chemicals, etc., we can actually change that creature pretty rapidly into a fossil. You know what? When we go to the fossil record today, we actually find evidence that creatures were buried rapidly in the past. Here is one of a fossilized fish. There's the tail, there's the head, but look at its mouth. He's busy swallowing a smaller fish. So that guy got buried during his lunch break. <laughs> That's how quickly it happened. Here's another one. This is of a female ichthyosaur. It's like a reptilian dolphin. They're extinct today. There's the head, the body, there's the tail. And we know that's a female because she's busy giving birth to a young one. So during the labor process, she got fossilized, which again is pretty rapid. But we are not only being told today, you know, it takes millions of years for these fossils to form. We are also being taught by the world that fossils are millions of years old. But again, when you go to the fossil record and you do proper scientific research, we actually find evidence that even dinosaur fossils are relatively young. In 2005, Dr. Mary Schweitzer got the shock of her life when she discovered soft tissue in a dinosaur fossil. She's an American paleontologist. They dug up a T-Rex there in Montana in America with a transportation process back to the laboratory. They had to break the upper leg bones in two because it was just too heavy to fit into the helicopter. So they broke it in two, flew that skeleton out bit by bit back in the laboratory. The idea was just to go and glue those leg bones back together again. But before they did that, they said, you know what? Nowhere in the world are there people going around breaking open dinosaur fossils to see what they look like on the inside. Let's first go and have a look what these things look like on the inside. They grabbed their microscopes, they started looking there on the inside, and then they came across stuff that looked like sinews, blood vessels, blood cells, and Dr. Schweitzer said those things were still flexible and resilient. And when you stretch it out, it returns to its original shape. She says, if you smell the inside of the fossil, it smells like rotten meat. Now, of course, she couldn't believe what she discovered. That's why she admits she did her experiment 17 times over just to make absolutely sure it's really soft tissue that she discovered. Now, why was this such a huge find back in the days? This stuff primarily consists out of proteins. And we all know that proteins of dead things do not last very long. You know, a dead cat or a dog or whatever, they tend to rot away pretty rapidly. So how is it possible to still find soft, stretchy proteins in a fossil that's allegedly 65 million years old? 
You know, logically just doesn't make any sense, does it? So that's why our organization believes that that fossil is at most maybe just like a thousand years old, maybe just a few hundred years old, but definitely not millions of years. That's just totally impossible. And since that discovery in 2005, scientists worldwide have discovered soft tissue in dinosaur fossils more than 60 times already. And the world scientists do not know how to explain it away because that stuff is not supposed to be in a fossil anymore. Now, most of what I've showed you up to now and what we're still going to talk the rest of the evening about primarily comes out of the magazine that we publish. We've been giving it out now for 45 years worldwide, international magazine, goes out to more than 110 countries worldwide. 56 page, full color, glossy magazine. And we pride ourselves that our magazine do not have one single paid advertisement on one of its pages because we really believe that each one of our pages should be used to the absolute maximum to get this kind of information out into the world. Also in the middle of each magazine, there's a whole section dedicated to the smaller kids. So just again, to save a bit of time, at the end of this presentation, I will give you an opportunity and you can subscribe to our family magazine. But I've got a question for the audience who is still awake because I gave the answer away at the beginning of the talk. So I wanna hear from you, who can tell me? Up to now, we've seen that fossils formed rapidly in the past. Those creatures were buried rapidly. We also saw that the fossils are not that old as the world says they are, that fossils are actually quite young. So can you maybe think of an historical event somewhere in the Bible that could give us an explanation for the vast amount of sedimentary rock layers that are laid down all over the earth? And remember, sedimentary rock layers are laid down by water, it's your clue, and we get fossils in those rock layers. So can you maybe think of a worldwide water catastrophe somewhere in the Bible? <laughs> Noah's flood. I thought I had Jonah and the fish somewhere, but all right. <laughs> it's of course the flood. You know, a lot of people today don't believe this anymore, that it was literally a worldwide flood. There's a lot of theologians, not only in the world, but in South Africa, that doesn't believe this anymore. They tell me that over the telephone when I phone them to hear if we can do a presentation like this in their congregation. The guy on the other side of the line then tells me, listen, I must just realize that's a mythical event in the Bible. It didn't really literally happen. The creation account, it's, it's, it's mythical. It's not a real creation account. Those who do believe in the flood tell me, yeah, but it's like a localized flood there in Mesopotamia because there's not enough water on this whole earth to cover everything. Now, with all due respect towards theologians, if they start saying things that differ from what God says in his word, I tend not to listen much further to those guys. I go back to the Bible. Now, what does the Bible say when it gets to the flood of Noah? It says all the high hills and high mountains back in those days were covered with water, seven meters high. So according to the Bible, it was a literal worldwide flood. Now, if that really happened, what would we then expect to find as evidence for such a global event today on earth? I think sedimentary rock layers that lay down by water all over the earth with fossils in them. And guess what? That's exactly what we find. Anywhere on earth where we go and dig into the ground, we find the sedimentary rock layers that were laid down by water all over the earth with fossils in them. I don't know if you realize this, but God actually took four whole chapters in the book of Genesis on this one event. And I think if God takes four chapters on any event in the Bible, I think he thinks it's pretty important stuff. And I think he wants to communicate it to us and tell us, you know, we should pay a bit more attention to what it says there. But what's usually the first thing that comes to mind when you see a fossil? What do you think of usually the first thing? Oh, millions of years. Man, this is the evidence of millions of years. Not so? Again, because that's how we've been trained by the world to think. But that's not what should happen at all. The next time when you look at a fossil, any fossil, because we believe the vast majority of fossils were laid down with Noah's flood back in the days, this one probably also. So the next time you look at a fossil, do you know what should come to mind? You should look at that fossil and then tell yourself, wow, this is the evidence of God's judgment on sin. Because this is what happened four and a half thousand years ago when man was so rebellious against God that he wiped him off the face of the earth, saved only eight people, with those animals started over and fossils and rock layers are the evidence of that judgment. Now again, it's very interesting. Up to about 200 years ago, most people in the Western world actually believed this stuff. 
It was a, most theologians, most scientists believed in a literal six-day creation account. They believed in a literal worldwide flood. But ever since then, specifically Christians started playing around with the idea that, you know, maybe God created by means of evolution over millions of years. And I'm the first one to admit tonight, that's what I believe. For the first three and a half years of my university career, I was absolutely convinced that evolution is a fact of life. It has to be true. Just look at all the evidence. The professor says the truth, the textbook says it's the truth, the television says it's the truth. It has to be true. Now, thankfully, I didn't lose my faith at university. I still believe the Bible is still true, so I tried to reconcile the two with each other. And what I did is usually the first thing that most Christians do, and that is we run to the book of Genesis and we start to reinterpret God's word. And specifically those creation days. Who says those days were six literal 24-hour days? Doesn't the Bible also say for God a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day? But do you know what we do? When we think that way, we actually start placing man's ideas and man's theories and science at a higher authority than God's word. And you can't do that because isn't the Bible the ultimate authority for us human beings here on earth? So what we should do, and this is what we encourage people to do, we should get into the habit of always starting our thinking process from Scripture. So it doesn't matter which topic is being discussed, whether it is the topic of origins, something like abortion, euthanasia, homosexuality, doesn't matter. You always go to the Bible first and see what God has to say concerning that specific topic. Then we listen to what humans have to say concerning that specific topic. And if what man has to say differs from what it says in God's word, then man is wrong. And then man has to change his ideas so that it gets in line with scripture because you can't change God's word. And that's what we are going to do now in the second half of this presentation. I'm only going to use the Bible now as our point of reference to see what scripture alone teaches us concerning how this universe got started back in the days. So when we go back to the creation week, we see that at the end of the creation week, God looked at everything he created and he said everything was not good, very good. In the Hebrew context, it actually means he couldn't create it any better. It was absolutely perfect. It was paradise originally. So what scripture teaches us is at the end of the creation week, there was no such thing as death, pain, sickness, disease, suffering. There was no such thing as cancer. There were no, you know, blue bull supporters. <laughs> I won't cry. This perfect paradise in which we live. I don't know if you realize this, but God actually went to Adam and Eve and he commanded them to only eat of the plant material, the fruit and the seed. So humans originally were vegetarian. <laughs> but thankfully, who was the first guy in the Bible who God said, from now on, you're allowed to eat meat? Who was that? Noah. Yeah, when he got off the, off the ark, God says, from now on, as I gave you the plants, I will give them eat everything. The fear and the dread of you will be in everything. Now you can eat everything that creeps around and flies or whatever, you're allowed to eat meat. And he immediately built an altar, made a sacrifice there, and that is where Bridach started, right there. <laughs> Best command in the Bible. <laughs> Next verse, God went to the animals. He gave them exactly the same command. You are only allowed to eat plant material. So what the Bible teaches us is that at the end of the creation week, there were no carnivores. Everything ate plant material. But if we look at God's creation today, would you say the creation we have today is still a very good creation? I don't think so. Everywhere you look, death, pain, disease, suffering, destruction, bloodshed, sickness. What on earth is going on out there? Now, don't get me wrong, there is still a picture of God's goodness and of God's design, which is still visible in nature, but it's been marred by all these terrible things we see all around us. So again, let's start our thinking from the Bible and see if we can come to a logical explanation of why the world is currently in the state that it is. Can you maybe think of an historical event somewhere in the Bible that could explain to us what happened to that perfect good creation that God gave us originally and then went to change it to the one that we are stuck with today? Anybody? Sin. When they ate of the fruit, look at it. God came to Adam and he said, cursed is the ground because of what you did. And God actually warned Adam what would happen 
if you eat of the, when you eat of that fruit. In the previous chapter in Genesis, it says, For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, in the Hebrew context, again, it doesn't mean he would have dropped dead on that specific day. We know that's not what happened. So what it actually means is, Adam, from the day that you eat of that fruit, you will start to die. And you will carry on dying and carry on dying until you are eventually completely dead. In other words, Adam and Eve and all the living creatures started to age from that day forth. Everything was created to live forever. There was no death originally. And that's what's busy happening to every one of us here. We are literally busy dying because of what happened there in the Garden of Eden. And also, this is not just a spiritual death that occurred that day. It was definitely a physical death because we all know that verse in Genesis 3 where God told him, for I created you from dust and to dust again you shall return. And then in the New Testament, Paul comes along and he confirms to us this historical account there in the book of Genesis. He writes in Romans 5 verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. That is the true origin of physical death. You know, physical death is the evidence that God is serious about sin. The Bible never separates the two. Throughout Scripture, it's always sin and death, sin and death, sin and death. But it wasn't only man that got affected on that day. It was actually God's whole creation. The universe got cursed. Paul writes, Romans 8 verse 22, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And we can feel those birth, day, those birth pains every day of our lives. This is a broken, fallen world that we are currently living in. So what Scripture teaches us concerning how this universe came into existence is the following. It says, in the beginning, there was no death, no pain, no sickness, no disease, no suffering, nothing like that. But then we humans arrived on the scene. We rebelled against God. Sin came into this creation for the very first time. Now, what did we just read? What was the consequence of sin? Death, pain, disease, suffering, bloodshed, cancer, all those terrible things. And according to the Bible's genealogies, if you add them up, this event occurred only a few thousand years ago. That physical death and sin for the first time ever entered this creation. But this is directly contradictory to what our children are currently being taught in school. Because what are they being taught? Evolution. Now, what does the theory of evolution say? For millions of years, there's always been death, pain, disease, suffering, and bloodshed in this creation. I mean, you need that stuff if you want to develop from a simple creature to a more and more complex organism. But if this is true, if evolution is true, then it means there was physical death in this creation before Adam arrived on the scene. There was physical death in this creation before sin came into this creation for the very first time. And that is directly contradictory to what we just read there in Romans. Then a couple of verses further on in the New Testament, um, Paul again comes along and then he explains to us that we can actually only make sense of Christ's death on the cross in the light of a literal creation account. He writes in 1 Corinthians, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And again, not just the spiritual death he's referring to, but a physical death. Because otherwise then Jesus just had to die spiritually here on earth for our sins and be raised spiritually from the grave. But we know it's a physical death and a physical resurrection he went through. And then a couple of verses further, Paul says that the first man, Adam, became a living being. And then the last Adam, referring here to Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. So here we have the two Adams. There's the first one in the garden a couple of thousand years ago. There's the tree. And then about 4,000 years later, Jesus Christ, the last Adam. Not the second one, the last Adam. And once again, the tree on which he hung, the cross. And my question to you tonight is the following. Which of those two Adams do you think is non-essential to the gospel message? And hopefully you've made the connection by this time by realizing you need both those atoms to make sense of the gospel message. Because just look at this. If there wasn't a literal good creation originally with a literal garden and a literal tree, literal snake, literal Adam and Eve who literally rebelled against God, if that didn't literally happen, why on earth then did Jesus Christ die literally on this earth? 
What is the message of the last Adam if there wasn't a literal first Adam? Can you see the connection? You see, Jesus' actions in history only make sense in the light of a literal first Adam's actions in history. Now, what our organization is not saying, I'm not saying to you tonight that you have to believe in a literal creation account to get into heaven. That's not what we're saying because we believe it's through faith alone, in Christ alone, that somebody is saved by grace. But what we are saying is that you can't make sense of the gospel message without that literal creation account. And there's a lot of Christians today in the world that's not making that connection. Unfortunately, the world is making that connection. The atheists, the secular humanists, they are aware of that connection between a literal creation account and the gospel message. And you know, the world out there today knows the most effective way today to attack Christianity is to do what? Is not to attack Jesus Christ in the New Testament. No, the world knows that. They leave him alone. Guess which part of the Bible is currently being attacked the most by the world? The first few opening chapters of the Bible, specifically Genesis 1 to 11. Why? Because the world knows if it can sow doubt in people's minds what the Bible has to say there, they will doubt everything else they read further on in the Bible. And I showed you at the beginning of this presentation, it's been working for 60 years brilliantly in America. Those kids in America do not believe in that literal creation account anymore. That's why when they reach the New Testament with all those miracles, they tell each other, well, that's not true. You can't walk on water. You can't change water into wine. It is scientifically impossible. Those are just stories. It's not true. And ladies and gentlemen, it's coming to South Africa. In fact, it's already 17 years in our high schools. We are currently standing in front of a wave that is going to crash upon us if we don't wake up and do something about it. I believe we can still do something about it. We can get equipped with answers so that when the youth come to us, we can give them proper answers to their questions so that they can see what's written in the Bible is the truth. And if you do proper scientific research, it actually confirms everything that's written in the Bible. So let's summarize. Hopefully tonight you've seen that we are currently being told lies by the world concerning the topic of origins. You know, we are being bombarded by the theory of evolution that is directly contradictory to that literal six-day creation account in the book of Genesis. Then hopefully you've also seen that science, and I'm specifically referring here to those evolutionistic kind of sciences, those historical kind of sciences, that has become the absolute final authority for a lot of people today on earth. And according to that kind of science, the Bible has allegedly been disproven wrong in Genesis chapter 1. And because of that, there is today a massive increase in apostasy, specifically among young people worldwide. They don't even go to church anymore. You know, the youth come to us with all their questions. They don't only go to the pastors and the dominies and the ministers. They come to us as parents, grandparents, and they want to know from us, Dad, where did Cain get a wife? Mom, where do all the different races come from? Granny, where do all the dinosaurs fit into the Bible? And if we can't give proper answers to our children concerning those kind of questions, do you know what the kids do? Google. They're into the world. Why? Because children are made to want to want to have answers to their questions. And if we are not going to give them answers, they're going to look for those answers in the world. And the world is more than willing to give them answers, and they're going to be fed with all the wrong information. And that's literally where we are currently busy losing the youth. Hopefully you've seen tonight there is an alternative to the theory of evolution. It is called biblical creation. I believe it's a better alternative because it fits in better with the evidence that we have with us in the present. But also, as I said at the beginning of this talk, not a lot of people are currently being exposed to this kind of information. And those four points led to the last one, and it is that the Bible got disconnected from reality for a lot of people today on earth, specifically the book of Genesis. The world doesn't look at the book of Genesis and see it as an historical document anymore. You know, of all 66 books in the Bible, can you maybe guess which book is currently being attacked the most by the world? It's Genesis. Why? Because it's the first book in the Bible. That's your starting point. That's your foundation. Everything else follows on Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. We build our whole Christian structure on this foundation of Genesis. And what happens to any structure, any building, if you rip out the foundation? It collapses. And even the psalmist knew this a couple of thousand years ago when he wrote, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? 
So you see, ladies and gentlemen, Christians don't realize how important the book of Genesis is to the rest of our Christian faith. Because if we can't trust the Bible there, where can we start to trust the Bible? And that's basically what Jesus was referring to when Nicodemus came to him that evening in John 3. Look at what he told him. He said, Nicodemus, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Is it any wonder that people today out there who do not believe in a literal six-day creation account anymore, people who do not believe in a literal worldwide flood anymore, is it any wonder they doubt things like a virgin conception, to be raised from the dead, to live forever? I mean, that's scientifically impossible. To quickly get back to our magazine, now of everything that we've published and produced over the past 45 years, this is by far the best resource that we have. And we know this is the best thing that we have because people keep telling us that it is the best thing we have. Literally, year after year after year. So what the magazine does is it looks at all these so-called evidences for evolution that you will see every day on the television, read about every day in the newspaper. And then from a biblical scientific perspective, our guys write easy to understand articles so that you can make sense of those kinds of evidences. We show you all the weaknesses in those guys' arguments and we show you how the evidence actually better fits in with biblical history. And literally the biggest part of this talk and the next talk comes directly just like that out of the magazine. So the magazine is really something that we encourage people to get linked to because you know, within a week or two, I think most of you will forget most of what I said here tonight. But the magazine is something that will come to your house quite frequently and will keep you up to date with what's going on concerning this topic of origins. And also, literally over the years, we had thousands of life-changing testimonies from people because of the information in the magazine they were exposed to. Now, the magazine is a quarterly magazine, so only four issues every year, and you can subscribe only for a year at a time or for three years at a time. And as you can see, a three-year subscription works out a bit cheaper. Then literally, if you subscribe to the magazine, you will get it for free digitally. And then you will be able to upload it onto five different electronic devices. So it'll arrive per email, and then you can forward it to four of your friends, four email addresses, four different ones if you want every term. You can also subscribe to the magazine via the website at creation.com. But if you subscribe with me tonight, you are going to get a couple of freebies. Now, this morning when I got on that plane and I flew to East London, I sat next to a guy in here and I was coming to East London and he told me, Peter, you will never believe me. Us there in East London, we are crazy about things that's for free. <laughs> now, I don't know if that is true, but if that is true, I've got some good news for you because if you subscribe for a year tonight with me, I will give you a free backdated issue of the magazine. And if you subscribe for three years, I will give you two free magazines. The problem is, however, through the years, we've made use of the South African Postal Service, you know, snail mail. Exactly. So a lot of people tell us, I'm never going to receive that magazine. So if you don't want to take that chance, then we've got this option. Then you can only subscribe digitally. So then it works out about half price. You're not going to get the free magazine because next week they will send you the latest electronic version already. But I brought stacks of old magazines, packs of 10. That's on discount that you can buy if you want to take a physical magazine home with you tonight. So the forms that we're going to circulate look like this. All you need to do is just fill in your option. This guy wants the three years option. So you tick it on the left, tick it on the right. You fill in your information. Name, surname, if we must mail it to you, snail mail, telephone, email. If you only want it electronically, only tick it on that side and that side and don't write the physical address, but please make sure your email address is written on it. And then you will see these little tear offs, these things, you can tear it off. Please, tonight, after you fold it in, tear it off before you send the form along and then you can bring it to me at the back tonight, please. And then come and make the payment there. I've got a card machine and we have EFT forms by which you can pay. Otherwise, I have to phone you tomorrow. So please, don't make me phone you tomorrow. So those guys that circulated the forms are going to do it again, same way as earlier in this presentation. Just send it along the rows. While you are doing that, I'm just quickly going to show you the kind of things that you can expect to find in the magazine. A lot of people tell us, okay, but if you guys say the Earth is young, how is it possible that these rock layers formed quickly? I mean, aren't those things like millions of years old? And then we tell people, no, do you know what? If conditions are good, even rock layers like this can form pretty rapidly. Now, up to that yellow line, it's about eight meters high from where this person is standing. And those eight meter high sedimentary rock layers were laid down within three hours. 
eight meters high. How do we know that? We actually observed it happening. Mount St. Helens is a volcano that erupted in 1980 in North America. A week before the eruption, there was a pyroclastic flow. Now that's basically hot dust and gas that got blown out of that mountain at 160 kilometers per hour. And within three hours, those dust particles in the atmosphere came down on the ground and they formed those patterns, eight meters high. In the months after this, there were more of these eruptions and there were areas where those rock layers were laid down 200 meters high within a few months. So if conditions are good, things like this can form pretty rapidly. Something else that can form pretty rapidly are canyons. Now this canyon, they refer to it as the Little Grand Canyon. It also formed at Mount St. Helens about two years after the eruption. Now what happened here was there was a massive big mudslide on top of the mountain. Mud rushed down the, uh, the, the, the mountain and the water. It ripped this canyon open 40 meters deep within one day. That canyon is one day old. By the next day, they took this picture with that little river running there gradually down at the bottom. So you see, the world tells us, you know, a canyon takes millions of years to form. That river slowly, gradually carves that canyon out one sand grain at a time, slowly over millions of years. But what happened here was, so there's two ways to look at canyon formation. You can say, what do I need? I need a little bit of water and lots of time. Or you can say, no, you need a little bit of time and lots of water. And you will basically sit with the same end result. Also, literally thousands of man-made articles that we discovered over the years that turned into solid rock. That was a soft hat, which a miner forgot in a mine in Australia, Tasmania. The mine was closed for 50 years. After 50 years, for the first time, people went into the mine again. They saw this hat lying there in the water. When they picked it up, they realized it turned into a solid rock hat as it absorbed those minerals from, out, from the mine water. This one is a fossilized bag of flour that was found in an abandoned mill in America. And that flower fossilized so well that the bag that used to be around it, it had a, a stitching pattern in it. And that stitching made a pattern right around that fossilized flower. And then finally, there's heaps of resources I have at the back. There's lots of books on the website itself. There's lots of videos, podcasts, and things that's for free that you can go and look at. So you can come and buy it tonight. Otherwise, you can order it online. Just go to creation.com. The office is in Durbanville. We will send it to you. We make use of courier services, so you will receive it, but you will have to pay extra, unfortunately, for the courier service. So tonight, you can save a little bit of money. Everybody asks me, what is the best thing at the back? What, what is summarizing everything very good? The undoubtedly the Red Book. I have it available in English and in Afrikaans. 60 of the most asked questions we've received over the past 40 years concerning creation, evolution, origin, science, and the book of Genesis. It's answered in that one book. And it's always the same questions. Where did Cain get a wife? Where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? Where do all the different races come from? What happened to the water after the flood? How did Noah get all the animals on the ark? How do radiometric dating methods work? Who made God? Number one question young children are asking us, Oom, wie het God gemaakt? Such an easy answer in the book. Next to it, you will see, <laughs> you will see there's a blue book lying. Now, this is our most popular creation book of all time. It was written by our head scientist, and he focused on all these so-called evidences for evolution. For instance, the missing links, which are still missing. So-called whale evolution. Human evolution, and one by one, it shows you very easy the weaknesses in those arguments. And what I love about the Blue Book, it's currently the stuff that the grade 12s are being taught in life science and first year BC at university. So if you may have a child or a grandchild that wants to go and study in that direction, please just get the Blue Book for them tonight so that they don't go to university and lose their faith there. And if you are thinking, man, maybe I should get the Red Book and the Blue Book, I have some good news. Because... <laughs> If you buy the red one and the blue one in English, you will get a DVD for free. Now, if you don't have a DVD player anymore, give it to a friend. If the Afrikaans people, it works like this. You have the books in Afrikaans and then you will get this talk that I did now here. You will get it in Afrikaans, digitally downloadable from the website. That's the only talk we have in Afrikaans. So then you can download it, show it to your friends, forward it to your friends. 
This is literally the Rolls Royce of creation books. It is an 800 page verse by verse commentary just on Genesis 1 to 11. It's not only a theological commentary and a historical commentary, it's also a scientific commentary. And the author went back to the original Hebrew and Greek translations of Genesis 1 to 11 to explain within context what it has to say there. A website, just again, creation.com. Please tell all your friends, your family about our website. You can also go and see where in the world we are doing these presentations. If you zoom into South Africa, it looks like that. You just click on the dates. It'll show you exactly which town, date, address, everything is there. So if you have maybe friends or family somewhere else in South Africa, please, if you see we're in the vicinity, phone them, encourage them to come and have a listen to what we have to say. And then finally, I want to encourage you guys to go and visit the website from time to time and read those articles. Literally, if it's only one a week, not only to get answers to your questions, but to really get better equipped to share the gospel message more effective in the secular world. I'm ending off with what Paul wrote in Romans 10. He said, how are they to hear without someone preaching? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Right, I don't know if there are maybe questions. If you heard, don't ask me where dinosaurs fit into the Bible because then I have nothing to say in the next presentation. But anything else maybe, yes. Now what we do is we, we oh, do we have a syllable, syllabus, syllabus uh, available? Now we have, um, we make use of the apologia stuff that comes from America. So we import it. We don't put a, a huge markup on it because it is very expensive, but we don't have our own curriculum now, unfortunately not. No, no, but a lot of homeschoolers buy their stuff from us at the office, yeah. Yes. Okay, did they survive or did they die? What happened to the sea creatures? Well, you still get sea creatures today, so not all of them died, but probably there could have been a lot of them or maybe just a few of them that died during the flood. Remember the flood, when I ask people, how long was the flood? No, no, it rained for 40 days. How long were they on the ark in total? Who knows? 375 days, more than a year. The, the primary source of the flood was the great fountains of the great deep that broke open and it squirted out water for 150 days. After 150 days, the level of the water on the earth just rose and rose and rose. After 150 days, God closed those mountains, uh, those fountains. Two months later, only then did the ark hit Ararat and it stranded there. Five months later, they were allowed to get off. So the primary source of water came from underneath. Now, of course, it went together with things like volcanic eruptions and tsunamis and earthquakes and mudslides, and it was absolute geologic chaos on this earth. So you would expect to find mostly, usually, the creatures in the oceans, they would have fossilized the most. And it's very interesting, 95% of all fossils on earth are marine invertebrates like this one. Small little things, bottom dwellers on the ocean. So the thing is, land creatures would have run to the tops of the mountains and the hills when this water started to rise. You won't expect land creatures to find fossils of them that much. Human beings also, they all ran to the top. And after the water kept rising, they started to float, grab onto vegetation, whatever. They died after a day or a week or whatever. What happens to you in the water when you die? You start to decompose and the sharks will eat you. That's why you don't find human fossils that often. We don't expect them to find those fossils. But the thing with sea dinosaurs and fish and things like that that lived underneath the ocean, those underwater waves and tsunamis and things like that, they were more likely to get fossilized. But we can't say conclusively, say for instance, the sea dinosaurs died out with Noah's flood. Could be that some of them survived uh, the flood, but over the years, you know, things just died off. But we'll look more into that in the next talk. Okay, yes. Yeah, you will not believe it. There's a whole chapter in the Red Book addressing that. I'm not lying. I'm not. We talk about defense and attack structures, but the quick answer is the following. If you logically work it out, God stopped his creation work after a week. So he didn't create new genetic information, for instance, new creatures. So he stopped after a week. But after a week, the Bible says they were all vegetarian. Now, even, unfortunately, I can't show you the picture now, but if I show the skull of a fruit bat to people, 99% will tell me that is the skull of a meat eater because it's got long, sharp teeth. The same with a, with a panda bear, very long, sharp teeth, but they are exclusively still vegetarian today. So teeth doesn't determine your diet. 
tea, the tea, kind of teeth you have is the kind of teeth that God gave you so that you can eat your food properly. But the thing is, now you have something like eagles, for instance. You know, they've got very sharp claws today and, and sharp beak and so forth. It could be that they use those apparatus to eat food back then, nuts. Um, the palm nut vulture still eats only palm nuts. It's got a very sharp beak. But it could be that after that six days, God, God is all-knowing. So he knew they will sin. They knew he will, uh, he will curse his creation. So he knew the fall will happen and... So we think probably he pre-programmed those animals with all the genetic information after the curse that some of them could have turned into carnivores or some of them decided just to remain vegetarian. I mean, even if you look at the dinosaurs, the vast majority of them are still herbivorous. The, the skull, if you look at the teeth structure and so forth, the vast majority of them still ate plant material. But we think that God, because he's all-knowing, he pre-programmed with all the variety. So through processes like natural selection, survival of the fittest, adaptation, some of those creatures could have, you know, kind of like decided to turn into exclusive carnivores. We had two different articles of two different people in our magazine over the years. They both had a tame lion in the house. Both those guys, lions, refused to eat meat their entire lives. They actually, had, um, it's Vedenskapper, bets, they had bets with people telling them, you can bring your own meat, see if you can make my lion get to eat meat. Both those lions refused to eat meat. The one lion, its entire life, only ate pasta. <laughs> the other lion, its entire life, only ate vegetables. Cool and broccoli. Mm. Literally. <laughs> Literally, carrots, I don't know what they ate, but they literally, their entire life. So you still have creatures that's today exclusively carnivorous, but they can survive on an exclusively herbivorous diet. That is still possible. Right, I think, let's take a break and then...